I am here today to talk to you about anything you want, seriously. I know this is the last session. I can't imagine how tired you are. I think I have about 30 minutes, but I was hoping to include in that some time for questions. Because why not, right? If you want to be a writer, you need to learn how to ask questions, particularly if you want to be a nonfiction writer, because you're not allowed to make it up. That's the worst part. I keep, every year I say, I'm going to become a fiction writer. And every year something happens that requires me to write something nonfiction. And I'm sad. Uh, but I'm gonna to talk to you today about why I do it. And I'm gonna to talk to you about fear and how fear can be something that stops you uh, from writing. And it can also be something that starts you. First, I'm going to tell you something really self-serving. The latest book that I just wrote called uh, Extreme Mean is, uh, it took about two years of research undercover online. The question that I had posed myself was, writing is such a lonely sport, isn't it? I, I wanted to know why, and so many people online were behaving so terribly badly and women in particular were being targeted. So what started out as a book my publisher at Random House had requested, you know, please try to find out what really happened to Amanda Todd, turned into a much bigger, who is ruining the internet and why are they doing it? And then yesterday, so the book got published, you know, it's doing well, it's helping people, apparently it's scaring people. But I got a phone call yesterday, and I was told that the book has now just been shortlisted for the Arthur Ellis nonfiction crime book of the year. Crime book. No, but, but, no, but, but uh, sure, that's great. I won't win. I, this, this is the thing. You need to understand about this. When you hear people are shortlisted, and you think, oh, my God, why am I not winning anything? Shortlisting is not about winning. It's about going along in your regular day, trying hard to be a writer, which is difficult, and you feel, you know, your confidence is usually about here, depending on how your writing's going, and then all of a sudden you get a phone call and they tell you you're nominated or shortlisted, and you think, wow. And then you go to the event and you sit around in a big room with tons of strangers, and they declare you a loser. <laughs> no, it, it is the most astonishing experience. And, well, you know, when it first started happening, I thought, oh my God, I'm terrible, I'm terrible. And then people tell you, yeah, just to be nominated. And it's true, it is. It's amazing to be nominated. But it's a big panel of people, and then they pick one person, and then everybody ignores you because you're a loser. Anyway, so I'm looking forward to that experience again with the Arthur Ellis Award. But what really, <laughs> but what really struck me about that is I had no idea I had written a crime book. And then I went back and I realized how astute of that panel, because I was writing about, or I was reporting, because it's nonfiction, about women online who were being stalked and harassed, young girls who were being sexually exploited as Amanda Todd was, although yes, I know the Dutch trial hasn't taken place, but I've seen the evidence. And, you know, kids being bullied, people being bullied, men, being bullied, people who had anything that is a, a latch. So any otherism. So apparently you're supposed to be a certain way, and if you're not, then we want you to die. That's, ge that's generally the message online. Or what we would prefer some of these people is, we will find you, we will come to your home, and we will do torturous things to you because the goal is for you to die because you're of a different race or a different gender or a different ability or a different sexual orientation. So you must die. Anyway, I spent a lot of time getting very, I have spent, hello, you're not late. Oh wait, you are. You better hurry up. I'm kidding. I teach uh, digital journalism and, and uh, television broadcast up at Seneca at York. So I teach college and university students and it is an incredible power when people come late to your class to say, where have you been? I mean, it's just, Anyway, let me get back to what I'm talking about. So I just wanted to let you know that the reason I write nonfiction is I think because I can't stop. And we're talking today about witnessing. And 
I had an experience uh, listening to, uh, well, hearing from Barb, and I want to tell you about it. The first thing I want you to know is I've been toying, I shouldn't say toying, I've been angsting over this question, and I know the light's not great, but somebody asked me, you know, why do you write? It's a question you all must get asked. Like, what are you doing? Maybe you're not published yet. Why are you in your room? You know, that kind of thing. But this was asked by somebody... Oops, I hate PowerPoint. I'll tell you why I figured it out, that writers aren't good at it. Hold on. This is a guy who asked me this just about a month and a half ago. Mark Raines Roberts is a really famous photographer, and he's the guy who does all that beautiful uh, crystal sculpture. I don't know if you've ever seen him. Go online. He's amazing. Anyway, he's putting together a book about Canadian authors, lots and lots of them. And <laughs> remember, he's a photographer, not a writer. So he takes your picture... And then he asks you that question, why do you write? And he wants you to answer it immediately and in a couple of sentences. And then he's going to put all of those sentences in a book. And you realize, so therefore you're thinking, okay, that's a permanent, I better come up with something snazzy. Why do I write? Why do I write? And so I started thinking that way, and of course I have no idea. Or so I thought. And then Barb Hunt, who, I've decided I'm going to call you the muse of the Ontario Writers Conference. Barb is the kind of person who sends you really cheerful emails way before things, and she knows that it's so far off. She goes, do you think you'd be able to speak, you know, in like 10 months? And you go, sure. And then it's one week before, and you think, wow. So <clears throat> she told me she wanted me to talk about writers writing about writing, and so I was waiting for the answer. I've been waiting for that answer now for a long time. I've been waiting for that answer. She's still not in the hospital, by the way. Kate Middleton, have you heard? She's still not in the hospital. I'm waiting to hear whether Kate has a girl or a boy. But I was also waiting for the answer. And I, initially, I, I decided that since I've been writing for about 25 years, why don't I know the answer to why do I write? And then I thought it was writer's block. How many people in here get writer's block? How many? Like, seriously, put your hand up. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shame you all, so put your hand up. Okay, so here's what I figured out about writer's block. And as I say, I've been writing to, you know, buy food and live in my house for about 30 years. I thought I got writer's block until I realized I don't. I don't think there's any such thing as writer's block. I think that I just don't know what I'm talking about. No, I'm, seriously, I, I've sat at my computer literally for hours with a deadline, you know, for a magazine piece or a newspaper piece, and it's like, oh, I have writer's block, and then I go running, but I hate running, so it's like five minutes, and then I come back to my house, and I eat, uh, and I drink wine. But the, but the secret about drinking, even though there's this big old thing, you know, there's a stereotype of the drinking. That Winston Churchill drank a bottle of champagne each day, and he's one of the most beautiful and prolific writers there was. It, it, I don't know how they do it, unless they were alcoholics, because the truth is, if you write, you can't drink, at least not while you're writing, because it'll all be ridiculous, right? So I've tried that. And then I finally figured out that I can't stop myself writing when I have enough to write about. So if you can't write, it's because you need to do more research. If you can't write fiction, it's often because you really don't understand your character. And if you don't understand your character, how can you tell anybody else about them? Particularly in the case of nonfiction writing, it really helps to overdo research because at some point after you've, and I really overdo research, after you've amassed this, you know, the copious amount of information, you get incredibly irritated. There's so much information, you better write it down. And so that motivates you. But I also, and this is what I think Barb sort of wanted me to talk about today, because I don't know if you know, but the reason I mentioned the crime thing at the beginning is, I write a, about a lot of topics that are really scary, and I never intend to. I don't set out to go and find Carla Hamolka. Well, I did set out to go and find her, but I didn't, I didn't think until it was too late how frightening that would actually be. And, the, and anyway, I don't want to get ahead of myself, because this stupid PowerPoint thing, it, you have to follow it, which is why most writers don't like it. And there's another reason writers don't like PowerPoint. Apparently, Lyndon was here at lunch, 
Uh, Lyndon McIntyre told Barb that he loathes PowerPoint. Part of it is that Lyndon probably can't work it. I'm sorry, Lyndon. I know you. Uh, but I think I really know why he loathes it, and, and I loathe it too. We're writers. PowerPoints are about points. They're about tiny little bits. And so what happens is when you start trying to write a PowerPoint presentation, if you are a writer, you will start writing sentences. And you will fill all of these slides with long, long paragraphs. And that is a bad PowerPoint person. So I'm a bad PowerPoint person. But I want to talk to you today about why being afraid can actually be the best tool you can ever have. Uh, has everybody in here felt afraid when they were writing? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hi there. <laughs> right. I, I'm afraid in a bunch of different ways, but I just wanted to thank Barb and also Mark, who's not here, for making me realize why I was afraid. Now, I've been afraid because of some of the subjects that I have looked for. I hate this picture of me. This, this came from McLean's magazine. They did a big piece on it. But somehow they stuck my face beside Carla Homolka's. This is a serial killer who helped kidnap and torture and rape and kill, along with Paul Bernardo, her sister, and other women, other young women. They stuck these pictures together so I can't get my face away from Carla's, which is really annoying to me, as you can imagine. This book I wrote called A Quiet Courage, it's about people who've had devastating things happen to them. The, their husbands, their husband and daughter assassinated, and you know, in one country and being in another country, thinking that you're going to die, that you must die, that everyone in your life is gone. Uh, people who've been tortured, uh, one teacher in Somalia by his own student, and then of course this one. This book, Extreme Mean, is coming out in paperback in August, and this book is so scary apparently that they are, cover they are changing the cover and the title. So the, the paperback, which is an expanded version, uh, it has happy people on the front, uh, and, it's, and it's, it's more of a guide now because I realize because I write about fear, and apparently in doing so, I scare others. But the real motivation of fear for me and the real answer to unblocking your writing ability is I tried to think, why am I really so afraid? Where do you think that's coming from? No, oh, no, 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 I don't mind. It's kind of cool. But maybe we could go next door and later and uh, have a cocktail. Right. <clears throat> so I figured out that you need, if you're afraid, you need fo to find something you're more afraid of. Right? Yeah, I'm afraid people are going to hate me. But hey, after being online for a long time, they're, they're going to anyway. And because they're not, you know, what extreme mean is all about is people say that anonymity is the reason we're so mean online. Or people say, well, people have always been mean and now we just see it. Wrong, wrong, wrong. There are different kinds of people coming from different walks of life, whether they are saddled with mental illness or they've got some real drug and alcohol abuse problems, whether they're angry, bitter, under extraordinary strain. There's all copycat. There's all kinds of reasons, and it does make you feel better when people tell you to die and other things that I've been told to do uh, online. Uh, it really does help you. But I realized that more than fear of writing, more than being judged, more than disappointing others, what I'm really, really afraid of, and I think why I bear witness, is that I am truly afraid that people will be hurt. When I decided to try and find Carla Homolka, I know that news teams had been on that investigation for some five years. I never looked for her. I had no interest in it. I had worked as a legal analyst on parts of her trial. As a lawyer, you know, like every Canadian, I was incredibly disappointed with the plea bargain that had her out of prison in a dozen years, even though when the tapes were later discovered, we knew that she had been much more involved in all of the crimes uh, than she had she'd ever let on. But as a lawyer, I understood why the court had to do that to protect the plea bargaining system. So I was really in conflict, and I just let it sit there. But I work online mostly. Almost all my work is digital. And uh, there was another trial going on, and they kept referring to Carla Homolka because it, it appeared they were going to sentence uh, a, a female um, 
a, a female accused the way they wish they had sentenced Carla Homolka. And my sense of injustice was like, what, what? And then I thought, where is Carla Homolka anyway? And I dug around and dug around and I found enough information that I believed that suggested that she was in fact living somewhere, the Bahamas, the Caribbean, France, and that she was teaching young girls the same age as the ones that she had helped torture and kill. I was criticized by some people for trying to find and finding uh, Homolka, but I was afraid that there was a chance we had handed off a convicted serial killer to another country and there were other young girls at risk. The court, the uh, uh, Quebec Appeal Court, after Homolka was released from prison, sitting alone, decided that all of the constraints that were to be put on her, that we needed to know what name she was using, we needed to know where she was generally, uh, and many other things, including she wasn't to be alone with uh, young people 16 years or younger, and she wasn't to teach. That's all she wanted to do, even in, even in prison, she wanted to get her education so that she could teach young girls. An appeal court stripped all those, re those restrictions away, and as a lawyer, I respect that, but as a journalist and as a citizen, uh, I, and a world citizen, we all are now, I was really concerned, like, is that the way it should work? And I do know that once you've done your time, you're free to go. But I do think that in a case where somebody is a serial killer, who we have evidence, and who in fact is, you know, a convicted serial killer, doesn't our obligation, isn't it a bit higher? I thought it was, and I thought, you know, I've been an investigative uh, reporter for a couple of decades now, and I'm really concerned. So if I don't go and look, well, who will? Well, probably no one, right? So it wasn't quite that easy. I said to my husband, I worked for two weeks nonstop online, just trying to cross-reference everything, try to figure out where she was. I was doing it on my own dime, so I didn't want to uh, waste any time. And just one day, oh, I finally, after doing all this sort of stuff, came across what I thought was confirmation that I at least knew that she was in the Caribbean and most likely in Guadeloupe. And my husband walked into the living room and I just sort of looked at him and I said, I think I can find Carla Homolka. But I, if I don't, I'm gonna waste a lot of money, <laughs> money that should go to our mortgage. And my husband is also in journalism and he's really supportive and so he said that was really great to go. And I did manage to track her down. And it was, I guess, I didn't realize how frightening it was until I was only, I could only afford to be on the island for five days. On the fourth day, I found what I thought was the clearest indication that I'd found her home. And all I wanted to do was to interview her and, and find out, are you, know, are you doing this? And uh, what I learned later as well is that the Canadian government had not warmed uh, the islands of, in the Caribbean that they are dumping a serial killer at, on them and that they were enraged. And the police didn't know and they were enraged. And um, for all appearances, it appears that she was in fact uh, trying to teach or teaching English as a second language, uh, which she no longer is doing and is back in Canada now. But my fear was that other people were going to be hurt. And I do think that in Canada, as much as she's free to live her life, that we do have a responsibility for how our justice system works. So I'm not unhappy with the outcome. I'm also, I mean, we can, I know everyone always wants to ask me more things about Carla Homolka, go ahead, we can do it in the Q&A, but I also wanted to, to tell you that I wrote another book which was uh, the, a Quiet Courage, which, which was about all of these people from around the world who had survived this most, most horrific experiences that I mentioned and had not only recovered afterward, but had actually flourished in a way they wouldn't have had they not gone through these life tragedies. And I remember the day, I had been working at TV Ontario and I did a couple of shows there. One of them was called Person to Person and most of these people in that book I met on that show. And I remember one day thinking, I, after five years of doing that program, and I know so many more things. I, it's helped with my frustration level. I understand now that when things happen in our lives, 
We don't even have to become a magical thinker to say it's because it was meant to be, but just simply it gives us opportunities that instead of being frustrated and angry about, we can instead ask ourselves, well, what's, what opportunity do I have to learn something here? You know, maybe I am caught in traffic, but maybe that's because there's an accident two hours down the road that I'm gonna miss. You know, that's magical thinking, but I, I guess I, I do it too. So I wrote A Quiet Courage because I realized I, it was, inappropriate for me to have learned as much as I did from all these people and not share it with somebody. I also write about people who are amazing and who aren't given the opportunity to speak for whatever reason. Maybe they haven't written or maybe they live in a place in the world where a few, few of us can go. And I want to give them a voice. And I am also wrote extreme meme because I was really, really afraid that people who are being victimized online had no way to be heard. And that I know absolutely the damage, the psychological and the physical damage that's being done to people emotionally online. And it isn't just people who are targets. It turns out, you know, lots of research around the world, it turns out that when you and I are online and we witness this kind of badgering and bullying and harassment, we are also affected by it. It demoralizes us. It makes us, it actually affects our psychology. And we all know, because we understand now that the brain is elastic, that constantly seeing this kind of information can trigger the same sorts of reactions that the victims or targets of cyber abuse are experiencing. And what are they? Depression, huge. What does depression do? It leads people to bully online. Vicious circle. People who are targets online or people who are online a lot and see the abuse are more likely to have trouble at work, at school, and at home. You're more likely to be drawn to substances to try to quiet the pain. So we've got, we're creating substance abuse as well. There's lots of other things. You have to read Extreme Mean, which is available for sale just over here, and I'm happy to sign it. So is A Quiet Courage, by the way. But my fear was that, that these people weren't ever going to be heard, and it was really important to me that, that, they, that they do. Um, the other thing I'm really afraid of, and I haven't figured out a way to fix this, is I'm afraid that we're not, we don't see sufficiently the power of our human bonds. And I think I write because I'm trying to do that. I'm trying to say, hey, look, this person says this, and it's really interesting, and this person says this, and if you can just read all these things, you can be a part of a world even if you physically cannot transport yourself to do the interviewing. So I see myself as a conduit, not as, you know, I think Lyndon must have talked a little bit about humility. We get hung up on the idea of being something. Oh, I'm going to be a lawyer, I'm going to be a dentist, I'm going to be a writer, I'm going to be a movie star. You really got to get out of the way of yourself because writing will not come if you're thinking that you want to write because you want to be a writer. You have to write because, this is where people say, you, can't, you know, I can't help but write. Well, yeah, you can, you know, you could. Uh, and some of the greatest writers never did write or publish. I mean, they wrote, but not for anyone else to see. We found that out afterwards when we discover letters and things. But I have to do this. I don't know about you. I don't know what you're afraid of. I know that the terms of agreement for using the wireless at this place have just, they've just, they just need to be renewed. You know, you think once is enough, right? Okay, I buy into your rules. Uh, so overcoming fear. The things that get in the way for me are, A, I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm really afraid of what other people will think if I put my words down on paper. I'm really afraid of what other people will say, which I've learned is the nicest possible things you could ever imagine, and the most horrifying, degrading, demoralizing, insulting, harassing, which I now understand as BS. And I'm afraid what other people will do after they read what I write, including sometimes I get afraid. I mean, now in Canada, with this, all this new legislation that's cutting down on our freedom of expression, and I'm, for the record, I am opposed to terrorism. I am opposed to terrorism. But it is appropriate to talk about the, the, the legislation that's coming down right now that is gonna make it more difficult for all of us to freely express ourselves. So I do have a fear uh, sometimes when I write. We're clapping because we're talking about Bill C-51, which ostensibly is about uh, fighting terrorism. And what we're being told by the government is that if we will not wholesale back Bill C-51, it's because we are not 
angry with terrorists, because we don't want to fight terrorists, because maybe even we are terrorists. That's the biggest piece of illogical thinking one can ever imagine, right? And so the reason I bring it up is I didn't used to be afraid of writing in Canada, but now because that particular law, which appears like it's going to pass, what you're not allowed to say in Canada now isn't defined. And the lawyers and the legal scholars have been looking at Bill 51, and these are really bright people. They can't figure out what's against the law either, what's going to be against the law. So now I have this strange feeling, because even when I write stuff about the anti-terror, about terrorism legislation, I start being afraid. So that's just another little thing I'm afraid of. That's just a, a by the by, personal little thing. But what I discovered is that if I am instead take that fear, which we all have, we have to, we're insecure, that's how we survived as human beings, by being insecure. If we were completely complacent, then when it snowed, we wouldn't have gone indoors, and when we realized the crops didn't grow in the winter, we wouldn't have stored stuff, and when we saw a big scary animal, we wouldn't have run away, right? So fear is good, but you have to get a control on it because without the ease, I find it hard to write. I need to have a sense of ease and I need to have a drive. And I find that if my fear of failing others is there, it completely dominates the fear that I have for myself. The fear that really I would like to tell you I don't have anymore, but who are we kidding? Uh, sometimes, though, it, it, I, I've developed it more. I have to say that my sense of social conscience, my mother gave me the other day my grade one report card. Grade one. And they used to, I don't know what they're like now, but there were these little yellow papers with these big lines and the beautiful handwriting of, of your teacher. And in grade one, my teacher had written, Paula Todd has a very highly developed sense of conscience. In grade one. No, well, how would you judge that? Oh, you don't have a cookie. I'll give you half of mine. I never gave anybody a cookie. Really. <laughs> I kept the cookies for myself. So I don't know what that is, but it's, it's a part of me. And it's become so great now that I have done a few things in the last while that probably aren't very wise because I lost sight of being afraid for myself. And I have to say that did get, in, get me in some trouble. I was trying to track down, I was um, working on Extreme Mean and I was on a big investigation trying to get closer to the people who had humiliated and harassed Amanda Todd. She's the young that girl in, uh, just outside Vancouver who took her own life because of the bullying and the sexual extortion, the blackmail that was going on online. And, and you know, so we have some clues and leads and I was trying to figure that out. And I was at my, I live in the country, not far from here. I live in a little hamlet near Uxbridge, right in deep in the forest, and I'm outside doing something, and a police cruiser pulls up. This was just, I don't know, about five months ago. And that's weird, because I really live in the forest, and I'm feel, I feel generally really comfortable with police when they're nice, because they protect us, they do a lot of great things for us, and uh, police officers in the past have been incredibly supportive when I've been doing research into things like internet trolling and pornography. But here's a cop, all the way out here. And he gets out, and he's very big. Sort of like this guy, but this guy looks like he's a Brit. I don't know. And uh, he says, uh, are you Paula Todd? Anyway, it turned out that on one of my investigations, somebody had spotted my license plate in a place I shouldn't have been and called the cops, and the cops traced me. Even the thought of this is terrifying. And had come to find me and tell me that, you know, I'd parked somewhere I wasn't supposed to be, I was driving too fast, whatever. He said, well, what are you, what are you doing? What, what is it that you're trying to do here? And so I said, well, you know, there's all these really bad internet trolls, and I'm, I'm tracking some of them, and, I, you know, I thought I had one. And he, he said, oh. And then he said, are you that reporter who tracked down Carla Homolka? I said, yeah. And that's, he looked exactly like this. He went, what are you doing? I, <laughs> I said, well, there's a lot of important things that need to be done. And, and if I don't do it, who's going to do it, right? We all have to do something. He said, yeah, but you could have gotten killed. I said, I know. I realized that while I was inside the interview, but I was thinking about it so much. And he told me that I shouldn't go after trolls and bad people online because he says, you don't know what people are like. They're animals. They're animals, he said. They look nice one second, and then they can just attack you. And from his perspective, absolutely. And I really took that information to heart. But I still would have done what I do. And I'm pretty sure that I'm going to find myself in those sticky situations again, if I feel sufficiently motivated. So to help you, if you want to take away anything from this, is try to find something that you're more afraid of than yourself. I mean. 
Are you afraid that your ideas won't be heard? Are you afraid that somebody could be hurt? Are you afraid that you have something to say that's never been said before? Are you afraid because you're just afraid and then that's just a waste of time and you really need to get over that? Right? And then let's just go back to that very first question. Why do I write? Initially I wrote this down for this photographer guy. I write to help others, to communicate, to bring people together, to experience life in the presence of others. And then I thought, you know, it's kind of boring. I mean, it's all true, but it's pretty boring, right? And then I remembered something. I write because it's the most extraordinary feeling I have ever had. It is the ability to be inside and outside oneself at the same time. And I love language. I love it. I love it. I love it more than cookies. I love it more than a beautiful day. I love it more than the texture of cashmere. Sitting down and writing when I'm not terrified is the most extraordinary experience I ever had. And that's when I realized that one of the, and one of the things I've told Mark, and I guess will be in the book, is writing is hunger and satisfaction all in one. It's the hunger, perhaps, for you to express yourself. It's the hunger, in my case, to warn, to share, to fight. I'm a bit of a fighting writer. So I leave it with you, and I thank you for that very annoying question. You don't have to know the answer to why I write, but if you begin to explore what's really underneath this drive, the drive so sufficient that you've spent Friday and Saturday here, except, except for the loot. Boy, I would have come earlier for that raffle if I'd known. <laughs> but really think about it. Because if you do, you may find that that's a happy place you can go back to that will prevent writer's block. And if that doesn't work, I'll come back next year. And I'll tell you it all again. Are there any questions? We've just had one of your colleagues sharing with us that he's a fiction writer. Crime writer? No, I write uh, young adult fiction. Young adult fiction. Good for you. That's a huge industry. Uh, he writes young adult fiction, but on a nonfiction side, he is a survivor of uh, sexual abuse, and he's working with a men's group, and they're actually tracking down some of the people who, who, who abuse them. And he's wondering, how do you get over the fear of sharing that publicly? And one of the first things that I always do is I ask myself, what would happen, what would happen if you published? What would happen? <laughs> no, but, no, but, but, but uh, just answer uh, candidly. What would happen? What do you think would happen? What is it you fear will happen? Okay. I have a really good friend who was the first victim of the hockey coach who is in prison right now. From the Maple Leafs, yeah. And, and he hasn't talked about it, in part because of his guilt, that he, he pressures himself into thinking that had he gone public when he did, nobody else would have suffered the abuse, which if you know anything about pedophiles, that th wouldn't have made any difference. I mean, if we'd had a legal system that actually would have acted, I mean, even now with so many victims, they're still not dealing with this as, as harshly as they should. Do you know what I'm saying? Um, but what you need to ask yourself, and remember, first, ask yourself, what am I afraid of? Then, you just don't do it because you get the answer. You weigh you weigh the cost of what you want to do. There are many things I want to tell you and write about, but I can't right now. One, because some people are still around who can't. Others, because I think I'll get sued. Others, because I'm afraid of who knows what, the boogeyman. But in your case, you know, it, it, in my friend Greg Galhuli's case, and he is writing about it, it's because he needs to bear witness to what was done to him and what is being done to people all over the world right now while we're speaking. And that fear that others will suffer has allowed him to leapfrog over his own fear. And what's happened, and I can see the change in him, is you realize that you don't, you shouldn't, I won't say you don't, you shouldn't have anything to, 
to be afraid of. The people who should be afraid are the abusers that you and others are going to help highlight. So the attention isn't for you and what you've endured. The intention needs to be focused on the guilty. And the more voices that, that, that rise up, the more likely that is to happen. Go forth. Thank you. <laughs> Sir, anonymity is an accomplice. Make no mistake. You know, if we weren't able to sort of slide around, uh, then we have all. You know, we, we wouldn't be doing some of this. And there's also research that shows it's crowd research, which we're quite familiar with. Which is, if you don't think anybody can see you, or if you're part of a mob, you're more likely because it's. You know, it's it's very. Uh, what did I say? Bye. You okay? Am I too late? Should I stop? Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you for clapping. Bye. Uh, gosh, um, and we do know that when we get into a mob, mob mentality, I gotta go, wrapping, um, mob mentality, of course, will make you do things you wouldn't. We also have an extraordinary number of young people. They came after the internet transitioned from military to mass use. The largest population online were young people, and they brought all of that with them. You have to read this book, but I, and I did all the research, like I reviewed everything they have. They're, this is the bottom line. There are people with certain sets of problems, which you can read about, who are disproportionately attracted to the internet. So most of us, you know, we're not gonna go there and spend open, I know I interview people who come home from a bad day at work, open a beer, and just sit there and try to destroy other people's lives. It's how they can get their frustration out because they can't yell at their boss. So there's all kinds of reasons, but rather than see the internet as this cesspool of true behavior, know that people with problems, including mental health problems, are drawn to the internet. And that's why we see a, a disproportionate amount of meanness. And that's also how we're going to overcome it, by understanding that. Thank you very much. You've been a great crowd. <laughs>